on the left side, you have the Y axis and the Y axis, you have scale. On the X axis, you have, let's say, automation. So you have this arrow that's sort of going up and right at the bottom, low automation, low scale are companies like Yahoo. Those are CPM based, it's cost per thousand, just good old advertising. Google is sort of middle level automation and I would say it's middle level scale. And that's a CPC, it's cost per click. The problem is that you got to click on something and if the viewability is low or if it's bots or if it's fraud or there's ad blocking, then what are you going to click on? I mean, a human is not even seeing it, right? And Facebook is very high on the automation axis and it's very high on the scale axis. And that's a CPA model. It's cost per acquisition that could become a commerce play as well, because now you have content that you're actually writing that will allow somebody to go to the brand's website and maybe convert there because you've educated them enough on your website. Well, you take them to the advertiser's website and they convert over there and you get a piece of that pie. Facebook and Google have put up walled gardens of data. The walled gardens are no surprise. They have tremendous first party data assets and reach which enable them to effectively target consumers and deliver high ROI to advertisers. And so what they're doing is they're extending this advantage across third-party apps. And these are third-party apps and sites to further further their dominance with the additional benefit of not degrading their owned and operated properties with more ads. Google has DoubleClick. It also has AdMob, which are these extensions. Facebook, it's Facebook Audience Network. It extends it to that. It has Atlas by Facebook. It has LiveRail which is another extension. I frankly think that Amazon is going to be the next third wall. It's a $5 billion advertising business for them, and it's just a matter of them deciding that they want to do that. There is this issue of fragmentation. It's a condition that is really unsustainable for both the principals and the intermediary. Marketers and publishers, two ends of the spectrum, they struggle with the complexity caused by the myriad of point solutions in the industry. There's too many companies in the middle. And for these intermediaries, it's a constant challenge to differentiate and grow with so much competition, which has led to what I call a pullback in venture funding. What the industry is begging is consolidation. You know, header bidding, for example, is a big thing. And I'll explain what that is. In fact, not just header bidding, I would like to add what I call adverse context into this list. It's a culmination of what I call fake news and brand safety issues into this mix, which is a big story this year, as obviously everybody knows. What one could initially dismiss as a simple hack, header bidding has turned out to be a lot more. It's really fundamentally changing the economics and relationships across the programmatic ecosystem in digital media. And it's a major disruptive force. This is what header bidding is. It's, you know, some people call it advanced bidding or pre-bidding. It's an advanced programmatic technique where publishers offer inventory to multiple ad exchanges simultaneously before making a call to the ad servers, right? So the idea is that by letting multiple demand sources bid on the same inventory at the same time, the publishers increase their yield and they make more money. See, for publishers, you know, true programmatic efficiency is a bit like alien life. It's probably out there, but nobody's actually seen it, right? I mean, Instead, what publishers to manage their, their, their programmatic yield um, thus far, what they do is they daisy chain it. It's a waterfall structure. The publisher offers impressions in one sales channel and the buyers are, you know, are not buying there. They push them down to another, less valuable channels until someone makes a bid. Now, the system works, but it's highly fractured and it's frankly inherently inefficient. So publishers say the system leaves money on the table. You don't want money on the table, right? So net-net, I think header bidding is a good thing. So a lot of the publishers and digital media ecosystem should adopt it. It accelerates the availability of high-quality inventory that will drive higher CPMs. The challenging aspect of header bidding, you know, there's always that, is the increased competition and tighter economics, which I believe will hasten consolidation in the sector. Now, the other thing when you're thinking about publishing content is privacy is an issue. Uh, There's this thing called general data protection regulation. It's called GDPR, which is essentially a a European, it's going to enter North America at some point. It's a European data protection regulation that'll go go into effect in, in 2018. GDPR, mark my words, will have a material impact on how companies manage consumer data. One of two, 50% of the companies will be underprepared for this profound shift. Earlier on, I mean, a few minutes ago, I talked about this life cycle of a media impression, which is really to highlight the challenges of fraud, unviewable inventory, and ad blocking. Now, marketers are taking a stand 
and demanding that we see changes to these issues. The marketers are doing it, right? So it's no surprise because viewability standards are very inconsistent across the major platforms. As I said, now there's this company called the Media Rating Council, MRC in our industry. You know, they've basically said the video, because video is huge now, because you're a publisher, you produce video. Video viewability standards right now, desktop on a you know, good old computer is 50% in view at two seconds and mobile is 50% view in two seconds. So it's consistent. This is MRC, which is the media rating council. Facebook has its own. Facebook says, no, desktop is 100% in view for three seconds and mobile is 50% in view for three seconds. YouTube says its own. It says 100% in view for at least 30 seconds or to completion, whichever is shorter, right? I mean, Twitter has its own. It says 100% in view for three seconds and then you have Snapchat. Snapchat, I mean, Snapchat is 100% in view upon start, right? Instagram is the same thing. In feed, in Instagram, they're, they're saying 100% in view for three seconds. Um, and their stories, which is Instagram and stories, Instagram stories is 100% in view upon start. So look, brand safety, which is important, has become an issue. Now, one of the reactions to adverse context in the sector has been the rise of premium publisher consortia. They're banding together. And they're offering advertisers aggregated premium inventory with large scale across their properties. The first one is called Concert. Concert is a combo of Condé Nast, NBC Universal, and Vox Media. Uh, the other one, which is a much larger one, is called Trust X. What Trust X is a whole bunch of large publishers. What the industry needs is valid third party measurement. All the major platforms cannot grade their own homework. There are standards that are being set by these independent third parties, like the Media Research Council that I said, MRC, and it's one second 50% in view standard, while technology vendors are being leaned on to push consistency across the industry. So even with standards in place, like the MRC viewability standard, we should be asking ourselves, are we measuring the right thing? Do you feel you're getting any value from these standards? Should we be focusing on something that has more to do with engagement? See, I believe we're on an inevitable march away from proxies and more towards understanding where consumers are spending time, right? How they are engaging and ultimately driving business outcomes. Amazon is playing a different game. See, Facebook says, I know who you are. Google says, I know what you might be looking for. What Amazon says is, I know what you bought and what you will buy next. And Facebook and Google, obviously, they have the demographic data. They got the proxies for intent. Amazon instead has true intent. It has purchase history data to understand the full customer journey. Amazon has unique data position in this ecosystem. It's all about building a brand. And so building a strong brand is not easy. The most recognized and iconic media brands were built from a unique voice, history, and frankly, many other intangibles. So in the New York Times, Vox Media, you got the Wall Street Journal, Vice, Business Insider, The New Yorker, BuzzFeed, Vogue, Financial Times. I mean, these are strong brands and they're a powerful asset because they are less vulnerable to ecosystem changes in monetization and the winds of programmatic as well as algorithm changes. And the frankly, the whims of major distribution platforms like Facebook, Google, and Twitter. So I envision the publisher value matrix, the digital media value matrix, with two lenses, the want to know and the need to know properties. Now, I'm witnessing some interesting developments unfold, like BuzzFeed, for example, is finding success with its new standalone food, food brand. It's called Tasty, and it's building a blueprint to start more vertical properties. Vox Media has gone pursued the strategy, right? It's a vertical strategy. They've built and acquired a family of verticals to you know, address all kinds of content and engage audiences. Right. I mean, Vox has what? I mean, in B2C, they got The Verge, Vox, SB Nation, they got Eater, Curbed, Rack, Z Code, Skip. So ultimately, publishers can build a loyal following and direct relationships with their audiences. They will have a wide variety of monetization opportunities beyond advertising. This is important beyond advertising. And these are the five things you're going to think about in digital media. One, advertising, traditional. Two, subscription, traditional. It's a newspaper, now it's online. Three, events. Think about that. Four, affiliate, which is commerce. How can I educate the audience and then be able to handhold them and take them to, let's say, Best Buy or Amazon or other e-tailers and have them transact there and then get, let's say, a piece of that pie. And finally, it's lead gen. Lead gen is a huge part of the internet. 